Hi, everyone. I hope you're having a wonderful week. Seems that uh, everything is working on, on all the platforms. So quick reminder, what I'm trying to do here with playing the unicorns is basically teach you everything I wish I knew when I was 20 and just starting out as a budding entrepreneur and that I now know. And that comes across either with content I create and how to raise money, how to have VCs evaluate startups, et cetera, or by having exceptional guests who come and share their stories, which are enlightening and, and really can be relevant for you. So this week, I'm going to be joined by Brian Reekworth, who's one of the best founders I know. I've had the pleasure of meeting him many years ago and investing in a startup, and he built the equivalent of Zillow, Trulia, if you want, of Brazil. And uh, he's going to share a story. He actually just released an amazing book called Viva, the Entrepreneur, and he's going to tell us all about it. So today, welcome to episode 19, Reinvesting in the Latin Tech Ecosystem. So Brian, thank you for joining us today. Hey, it's it's a really uh, pleasure to be on here. So maybe before we get started and like having a proper conversation, maybe give us a little bit of your background and your entrepreneurial journey, and we can take it from there. Sure. So for a reason, I'm from California, from from the Bay Area originally, and I got in my car and drove from California to Costa Rica, bought a one way ticket to Bogota, Colombia. And, you know, normally there's a, a woman behind these stories. And so my, my, mine is no different. Uh, I met a woman in San Diego. She likes to say that she imported me to Colombia. <laughs> uh, the story ends well. We got married and we have two kids. Uh, but I, when I was living in Colombia, I didn't really, you know, I wanted to extend my trip. In fact, my plan was to make it to Patagonia. But three months turned into six and a half years in Bogota, Colombia. And I needed to figure out a way to pay the bills. So I did all kinds of entrepreneurial stuff uh, in the early days from, you know, building websites to teaching English and then came across uh, a really terrible experience looking for a property. Um, and so that was kind of the genesis of realizing combined with the fact that I read a case study from Mercado Libre, um, you know, from Stanford. And I'm like, wow, why isn't there a Mercado Libre of real estate? So that was the original kind of plan, build the Mercado Libre of real estate. Quickly realize, as you know, marketplaces are difficult, classifieds are difficult. You can't you can't, unless you have crazy resources like you did, uh, build a, a machine globally. Um, and, and I didn't have any access to capital. So I decided that we, we would focus AAB, all about Brazil. And that's when I ended up moving down uh, to Sao Paulo and launching the business there, uh, eventually raising some capital. And then we recently exited to actually a company that you founded. So thank you. I <laughs> guess you played an important role there. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, but by the way, Yes, with OLX, I was able to launch with a lot of capital, but that was not my first few entrepreneurial journeys. It's just once you're a second or third time founder who's been successful in the past, people throw money at you. But the first few times was kind of like you. is like uh, no money. Like I, my second company, I think I missed payroll 27 times. I was living in New York and like $2 a day, sleeping in the cash in the office, et cetera. But a, a few things to unpack in, in, in what you just said. So first of all, I mean, it's not common that an American would go and move to Latin America uh, and, and even succeed there. Maybe you weren't, was there a connection to Latin America to begin with before that, or was it just all for love uh, immediately? Um, I would say like, you know, uh, see my wife sees this. She definitely, she was the main reason I was there. Yeah. Right. I mean, uh, I, but, but I did, you know, I did appreciate the excitement and the, you know, when I, when I was 16, you know, I was getting in a little trouble. Maybe my parents were like, you know, you need to maybe uh, maybe we should ship you off for a month. And so I spent a month in Costa Rica when I was 16. And that was like I got kind of excited by the fact of like being in this other country and learning a language. And so I would say that I was fortunate uh, to travel a lot as a kid. And so I definitely had the travel bug. Uh, and so I would say that that was like I realized that I could th thrust myself into different places and and it would it forced me to kind of like learn and see myself differently because I'm learning another language or I'm you know understanding another culture. And so I think you also have a great appreciation for like different countries. And you know you were in Dominican Republic. You've been all these different places, and that's something that's I, I find exciting and so that, that alive. Trip right to Colombia uh, to go meet your wife. Uh, how old were you at that point in time? 
20, I left when I was 23. You left when you were 23. Now, if I remember correctly, the the very beginning, you were you were actually pen Latin American. I, I think you might have even launched the site in, in, in Colombia. Like, at what point did you realize it's all Brazil, I need to move to Sao Paulo? Yeah, I remember really clearly uh, we, we had launched in Mexico, Colombia, Brazil. I even launched a website in Peru for like a month. And and quickly, you know, you know, the you know, the, the, the liquidity factor marketplace one, kind of one on one. You need to have that, you know, those those buyers and sellers connecting. And when I looked at the size of the market in Brazil, you know, I did kind of a, a, a you know, back of the envelope comparison. And I saw there was more potential customers in the state of Rio de Janeiro than the entire ch- country of Colombia. And so just the effort required uh, to be multi-country, uh, you know, with the constrained resources we had at the time, it just, you know, and also capital raising, like it was just, the, you know, you look at Mercado Libre's market cap at that time and majority of their revenue was from Brazil or a big portion of it. And so I just, the story um, and, and, and also uh, things took off faster there, right? Like there was just more growth because it was a larger market, more internet penetration, all those things that are important variables. So I think those are kind of the, but I remember having a, a, a debate about it for a long time because a lot of the US investors were like, no, just be every, you should yeah. be everywhere. And I'm like, maybe we should win a market. <laughs> like, like if we if we don't win the market, we're going to be, you know, number three in, in, in so five I markets. Sorry to Do you mind either removing the plants or because it's, the camera is focusing on the plant and not on you, so you're all blurry. <laughs> yeah, let me, let me, let me take this out here and um, here. All right, there we go. Make sure. Okay, yeah, that's good. All right. How's that? It's uh, uh, still not, the focus somehow changed. I, I'll teach you how to do this in the future. Like you need to, once it's focused correctly, you tell your camera to remove autofocus. We're not going to do this right now. I, I'm still I'm still learning. I have like the most sophisticated setup <laughs> that is in training. So uh, maybe there's a, uh, maybe oh, wait, there's perfect. a, a wait. Okay, perfect. All right. Okay. Now Thank you for telling me. Here. I appreciate that you would so, tell so me that. So a few that. things uh, to unpack in what you just said. So first of all, the genesis of the idea came from observing a, pe- a personal pain point. And actually, those are some of the more common entrepreneurial journeys. It's like, you know, this problem is so grating to me, I had to go and fix it. And, and you know, so yours was typical of that form where you're like, oh, renting a place or finding a place is impossible. Um, second point you pointed out is... In marketplaces, it's way easier to focus on one country than other than than multiple because the reality is being number one in like Rio de Janeiro it doesn't actually be, help you being number one in Bogota. I mean, if anything, it's like separate markets. You need supply and demand. And so, my number one recommendation to most entrepreneurs, and because most people think, oh, we need to be a global winner, is actually if you're in the U.S., do not go global. It's a distraction. Like it'll decrease your probability of winning. And I suspect that if Uber had to do it again. And they had to choose not going global but winning the U.S. It probably would have been a lot easier, cost a lot less money, and they probably would have been a lot less more successful for a lot less heartache. So, totally agree. By the way, do you think that today things have changed? Because it used to be for me it was all Brazil all the time, and we only, I mean, Olax was like most of the revenues and profits were Brazil, and that's probably still true today in Latin America. But I'm starting to see changes in the ecosystem. I mean, Rappi in Colombia is like changing the ecosystem in Colombia pretty dramatically. You're seeing Mexico come up and we just invested in Valorio, which is a Thracio equivalent for Latin America and Mexico. I mean, it, it, would your perspective be different in 2021 or start with Brazil or focus in Brazil if you can? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it, it, a lot of it depends on the, the resources you have, right? And the, the kind of the capital that, that that's available to you. I definitely think that the, you know, the, the you know, if, if you can, you know, if it's a land grab and there's an, an opportunity, you know, I think it depends on the business model also. Like, you know, marketplace businesses, for me, you know, I like to think about them in city, as city businesses, yeah. right? Like this is, people, t- people always talk about like Latin America or, you know, the region. It's like, no, this is like, we were Sao Paulo focused yeah. and then we had our plan to go to Rio and then it was Belo Horizonte. And so I think it depends a little bit on the one, the, uh, the amount of resources you have. I do think that now, given the appetite is larger in the venture world, you can expand a little bit the size of your ambition uh, early, as early, because I think that can attract also more capital. And then I think that you can, it can be a self-fulfilling prophecy if you can, assuming you can execute well. Um, so I think that the question of Brazil versus LATAM, I definitely think that, you know, teams like Rappi have showed us that you can drop into other countries and execute well. And, and I think that, you know, that, that, that probably changes a little bit 
um, from when I started out and and how I, I viewed it. Yeah, back I think Rappi is changing. Well, the thing is, Rappi had the ability to raise tons of capital, and that not everyone has that ability. So, a that changes, but the fact that Rappi has been successful, I think, is now creating models and and also in invest angel investors in the ecosystem in Colombia that never existed before. Like I'm now an investor in many companies in Colombia and until Rappi, basically, I never invested in a Colombian company. So things are changing, but I do agree with you in focus. It's like liquidity, it may not even be city by city. In, in some marketplaces, it may be zip code by zip code. I mean, if you're in a locksmith marketplace, you need the right supply and demand in a given zip code, and then you expand to control the city. And once you have liquidity and positive network effects, then you launch everywhere. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that's, I think that's like the cl most classic mistake I see entrepreneurs that are building marketplaces, you know, they, they, they don't get that right. And, and that's something that just, it, it unlocks so much value. Yeah, right? I, I think the biggest mistake I usually see, and it doesn't apply to real estate because you need it, kind of all the inventory in the city to make it work is actually in a, like in the labor marketplace, they get, because it's easy to get supply, they get infinite supply, but then they have no demand for it. And so the supply churns and they're not engaged. Whereas you should have just the best highly curated supply and match them and then scale. And in real estate is a bit different because if you have totally. 100% of the inventory, totally. you do better. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for us, it was a little bit different, but yeah, matching that supply demand is is, is critical. Um, absolutely. So, so you, you finished the journey and, and clearly it was, you know, there are ups and downs and there are a few things that came across in the book and, and we'll focus on a few elements of the book. Yeah. One, one element, I don't know if it's imposter syndrome is the right word, but sometimes from the outside, everything's going well. I mean, you're describing how you were, uh, when you were elected like entrepreneur of the year in Brazil. And at the same time, you were feeling that like you might go bankrupt and there's all these issues. And, and of course, when you know how the sausage is made, it's always like way dirtier than like seeing it from the outside. How do you, how do you, A, do you think that's imposter syndrome? Do you think it's something else? B, what do you think is the, is the right way to deal with it? Because uh, what, what is the correct level of transparency? Is that at the same time you meet? Yeah. 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 Okay. I, I think it's a, it's a fun question. And first of all, yeah, I mean, it, it definitely was imposter syndrome, I think, because like, I just didn't feel like I was up to, to the task, you know, at times and I was insecure about it. Um, that obviously fades away when you like gain more confidence and, but when you're in your 20s, you're starting out, it's pretty normal that you're like, you don't think, I mean, some people have, you know, exude confidence. And, you know, I think that some people happen to just, you know, entirely believe in themselves. But in my case, I was doubtful about my, my ability to, to do certain things that dissipated over time as, as I gained more confidence and had some success. But I think that the, the moments, you, you know, you're referring to, um, I think that, that that's an important element of when you're in the struggle and you're insecure about things and things, you know, can come crashing down at any moment because a startup is fragile, right? When you're, when you're building a company, there's so many uh, variables, so many ways you can die when you're building a company. Um, and so I think that the way to contend with that is to find a trusted network. I mean, what I love is talking to other entrepreneurs that have done it before and been skating on the edge, right? And then they've, they've figured out how to make it work because they're highly empathetic. They deeply understand the, what it feels to be in those situations. And then also they have the tools to navigate difficult situations because they've had to do that themselves on the journey. So, you know, when I talk to you about the difficulties, you, you know, you, you're, you'll just you'll, you'll go back to your early days and be like, I remember when this Absolutely. happened. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden there's like just a, a, puts you at ease because you're not alone in the journey. Yeah. And, and being an entrepreneur is very lonely in many ways, which is like not many people can relate. And, and I think, look, it's interesting because I lead a life of like radical honesty and transparency except where it comes to basically or, or, or how, how many days we have left until cash zero. And I know some founders who just tell the company and they use it as a motivating factor, but I think it's actually might be demotivating. I want to, I start from the assumption we're going to make it and I'm going to find money for the next round, right? Like I think you write in the book, the CEO's job is to make sure the company doesn't go under. And, and I assume, I think that's true. That's my role. I'm going to get the funding, even though we may be out of cash next month and I'm not going to make payroll, we're going to get there. And if, if you share that, you are running a cash a month, it actually would be, it could be very destructive. Like the investors could take fright, the employees would start looking for other jobs. And so as a result, you, you, you bear, you, you, you carry that cross. So you bear the burden alone. Yeah, it's, it's a, I think there's different styles, different approaches. I think that I, I ultimately did that. Um, and that was something that, you know, I think that it's a heavy burden, right? So 
Um, you know, maybe at this point in your career, it's easier for you to carry that yeah. burden because you've saved the day a couple times and you've, you know, you know, you've managed to figure out how to, how to make it happen. And that probably gives you the confidence to, to believe that. But when you haven't had that, you know, success yet, it, it's a, it's a heavy burden to carry. And I do think that there's one thing that is important not to centralize the burden completely. You have a team, right? You have co-founders, you have, uh, exec- executives on your team. And if they're there for the right reasons, there's nothing that can rally the troops more than, hey, we got to get through this, yeah. right? And so I think that that's, that's a, a caveat I would make. I do think that you, it is lonely at the top, but you should bring people into your inner circle of, of those challenges because otherwise you're going to assume too much. And you know, I think that you know, people step up. Yeah. I think it, you know, we're surprised sometimes by people thinking that we're the only ones that can manage these situations when there's execs that are you know, they come up with crazy solutions at the last minute because they also care. I know. Absolutely. If you build the right team, they, they're going to care and be completely aligned with like the, the mission and the survival of the, the company. And and by the way, it's not just execs, right? It's like coaches, advisors, mentors, uh, investors who can who can play a role here. Absolutely. 100%. So, so tell me about like, what motivated you to write the book? Like you had a book in you, you had a, it's a story to tell, it's lessons you wanted to share. Like what was the thinking, the, the desire? Because obviously you're not originally a writer. Uh, and <laughs> did you finish the journey you and you're say, like, oh you my say, God. You say, you say, obviously, you say, obviously, I hope that didn't come through in the writing. <laughs> no, uh, no, no, it's well written. Um, it's a fun just, story. Uh, it, it's just more, yeah. I know your background and you're, you know, more entrepreneurial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, thank you, thank you. I just wanted to to preface that just so that the audience knows that it's not a shitty book. It's a no, good just book. kidding. Um, <laughs> read it. Okay, good. No, no, um, no. You you wouldn't have me on. You, you read it already, so I think that you would have you would have canceled the interview <laughs> if you thought it sucked because this is your this is partially your brand here. Uh, so uh, thank you for signing up for this. I hope you don't regret it. Um, no. Uh, what, what when I when I think about the uh, the motivation, of Fabrice, you know, as I said before, this is a hard journey. It's lonely. And I don't feel like I had this resource when I started out. And, you know, I've had a good mentors, you know, we've had good conversations over the years, you know, Jose and, and others that have, you know, early investors. And I feel like I could count on resources. And, but it really wasn't until I had this community that I built of investors and mentors and advisors that helped me understand a lot of this stuff in the book. And so there was, there was probably a multi-year just kind of just, I was, I was lost, yeah. you know, I was lost in the journey. And so, you know, I felt an obligation um, and a responsibility to share and pass on the experience because it's what I wish I had when I started. And I'm, I'm a person that really believes in, you know, elevating others, um, you know, and, and that's something that I'm, I'm very dedicated to and I, and I believe in. And it's funny about it. The funny thing about that is you don't go into it expecting things, but the crazy thing is when you elevate others and you, and you help others, as you know, like you actually end up getting more out of it than maybe the person, right? Because there's just all these things that end up happening. You know, maybe someone, you help someone and then they send you another investment and then you, you find yourself like really serendipity. You know, it, happens, it's interesting right? because I never do things for, to help other people with the, to just be, for, with the expectation of getting something back. But like, there's this kind of positive karma. If you're like friendly, helpful guy, people want to be helpful and you're right. Like then they send you deals and they give you ideas. And and frankly, just being a mentor, you get so much out of it, be it on a one-on-one level or just to want to give back to the community. So I think it, it, it's its own reward. Totally agree. Yeah. So anyways, that's the reason why I wrote it. And, uh, you know, hopefully people can learn from my mistakes, right? Because there's, there's a few in there. Um, so, so, let's just say that. It's kind of- <laughs> well, I mean, your book is kind of structured around lessons. I mean, do you want to give a summary of like the, the key lessons? Like if, if not obviously going through all of them, but like what do you think are the key ones or the things that people should be aware of or think about that are like uh, what to do as an entrepreneur? You know, the way, the way I structured the book, and I'd love to hear from you what resonated most with you. I mean, you've been on this journey for a long time. It, the, the book is kind of, you know, tells the, the, the story through the sequences of building a business, right? Uh, because we, you know, we, as you know, I'm an investor, I'm not on, on the same caliber as you. I'm just a little angel <laughs> check here, uh, that I'll tuck in maybe uh, alongside you in some deals. And now we're building latitude to kind of formalize and structure that a little bit more because, you know, I've been, I've been able to get a, a lot of access to deal flow in the region, but the way I think about it is like, if you actually kind of think about pre-seed seed series, a series B series C, you know, I went through all of that all the way through acquisition. 
And so I, I tried to like, you know, uh, tell the story of parts of that and the lessons during the phases, right? When you're starting out and you're, you know, you're raising capital initially, or you're building, you're making your first hire, you know, I made so many mistakes mm. there, right? Like I, 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 you know, early on, we hired the flashy marketing executive from the big company because we thought that they knew what they were doing. But, you know, growth marketing is different than like running, running a team, you know, first day he's like, Hey, Brian, here's the org chart I want. <laughs> and I'm like, Whoa, whoa, whoa. You're, you're going to be in the Excel document. You're, you're going to be, you might have an analyst, one person, but like, you're going to be building the models. Like, you know, this is hands-on. And those are mistakes you make when you're just sure. inexperienced. Right, right? I made so all those I, same mistakes in my first company. I tried to expose all of those, those things uh, and, and, you know, exemplify the things not to do. And so I kind of told it in a, in a series. So, I mean, we cover everything in the book from co-founder dynamic, you know, challenges, uh, you know, communication, team building, hires, board, investors, you know, you as an investor now, you know, you have an asymmetry of information of when you talk to founders, right? Because you've been doing this for, for years now. And when you have a first time founder, how do you approach an investor? How do you find an angel investor? Um, you know, how do you build a good board? These are all things that just, there's not a lot of best practices out there. And, uh, and so I tried to, I tried to share the experiences, you know, and this is not a, a instructional manual yeah. for people. This is one person's experience um, and, and some lessons that I learned yeah, along I, the way. I, I mean, and you re re reference it, but there's a lot of pain and suffering in the book because I think the internal journey includes a lot of ups and downs and pain and suffering. And it reminded me a lot of uh, Ben Horowitz's The Hard Things About Hard Things in terms of like the entrepreneurial inter journey. And, uh, but I think that part resonated with you. It's like, it's, not, it's hard when, to do this or... It's, 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 it's definitely, it's definitely a challenging and, you know, I, I, I don't, uh, I still would never do anything else. Right. Like, so let's be, let's be, let's be real about it. Right. Like this is, uh, it's the most fun job ever. Right. So despite all of the, it's like complaining about the thing that you love, um, when re reality, like the excitement of it all is, I couldn't imagine myself doing anything else besides building companies and investing. Yeah, in totally. Companies. Look, I was having a conversation with a good friend of mine last night. We we're talking about like why sometimes the smartest people, you know, they go to McKinsey and Goldman and become lawyers and they don't actually become entrepreneurs. And the reason is, you know, when you're in school, there's kind of like it's a game and there's clear parameters and you're in a box and you know how to do get good grades. And then you go to Goldman or McKinsey and same thing, you're in that box and there's clear expectations. If you're an entrepreneur, there is no, there are no boundaries. Like it's an infinite game. There's anything, no one's telling you if you're doing a good job or a bad job, you have to realize it yourself. So it's a, it's a lot harder, but it's also a lot more fun. I mean, you're creating something out of nothing. It's like, I think the, the probably similar to, I mean, not that I know yet, yet, but it's probably similar to have like having a kid, right? Like goes from nothing to it grows up and you stumble along the way and you try to help it along to get to the right outcome. It, it's it's absolutely true. I have my my sons uh, my son and daughter's yeah. Valentine right here. So yeah, it, it's it, it's uh, it's it's there's a lot of similarities from like you know family and you know it's it's your great you know it's my greatest yeah. startup. Uh, very challenging and there are infinite things that can happen, right? So I, I love the analogy you say about the kind of the box and you know kind of the the McKinsey route, the Goldman route, and there is like a set of rules to play. I, I'd never thought about it like that, but. Uh, that's maybe because I just never did that. Well, I think it's because <laughs> but, I'm a video uh, game. I'm a gamer, right? And a gamer, you're playing a, yeah. in a world that's been built, and there are rules, and you can optimize the rules to get the high score. So if you're at McKinsey or what, even, frankly, even a normal organization, there's a way to get the high score to get the promotion, etc. If you're a startup entrepreneur, there's no playbook that tells you what you need to do next to do well, especially as you need to find product market fit and hire the right people, etc. And it's and and so you make it up along the way, and <laughs> it's super fun. I love that. I love that. Yeah, it is. It the, is. Wouldn't do anything one, else. One, the, the one little thing I didn't like about the book, by the way, is you start with the exit. And, 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 and the reason I didn't like that is it kind of made it feel or sound as though, and I think the intent is to show it was a big exit. It's a valuable company. And just 12 months earlier, you were like bankrupt. But it, it makes it feel like it's more about the money than I think it, it really is. Because we don't start companies because we want to make money. We, we start companies, and, and you say that very well in the book, we start companies because we see a problem we want to fix and we go and fix it. And, and so it's a mission driven. And I think the, the successful outcomes or byproducts, in fact, the people that are in it for the money, the fair weather entrepreneurs, they have a tendency to fall off along the way because when the journey gets really hard and it's like, whatever, you haven't seen your family in a month and it's 2 a.m. on a Saturday, if you're doing it for the money, you're going to give up. 
if you do it because it's your mission, your life yeah. purpose, you're going to keep going at it. Yeah, that's that's like the first chapter is all about that. So yeah, I tried to clarify that. I appreciate the feedback. The rationale for this, this I wanted a more shocking story in the beginning because it was the juxtaposition of like almost dying and then getting an offer to buy the company for like 600 times less than what the offer ended up being. And so for me, it was just like the ultimate way to illustrate just the the roller coaster yeah. ride that it is, where it's like this is so ridiculous. <laughs> but uh, you know, absolutely, the uh, I, I personally think that we failed, right? Yeah. So uh, th this book is not a victory lap. I, I'm I'm I was really hard on myself, you know, last year, and like you know, I feel like we fell short. And you know, I, I I'm, I'm on your show. It's it's you know, breeding unicorns or I'm sorry, unicorns. I got the name messed up. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, sorry. You're almost you, uh, but uh, but frankly, I think your company yeah, is worth yeah. a billion, right? Like, <laughs> no, it is, it is, and and I'm I'm not insecure about it or anything, but it's just it's just a uh, a fact of like, I think this thing could have been had a bigger impact. I think it could have changed the industry, um, and so that that's something that I just feel like we fell short on, and so but but I, I take your feedback of of leading with that, um, you know, maybe I wanted to establish yeah. credibility uh, and instantly. But, uh, but yeah, I, I think uh, uh, it'll be fun to see how people, the feedback has been good so far. I know, so I, I like the book. I hopefully think there's... Um, it's a great manual for like, especially first time founders, especially in Latin America, because the difference is in Latin America, you're playing the video game on heart. I mean, especially in Brazil, you're like the Custo Brazil and like exchange rates and labor laws and taxes, everything's hard. Uh, I mean... <laughs> I mean, maybe you want to touch for like the difference between operating in, in, in Brazil or LATAM in the U.S. Man, the, the, there's so many elements of, you know, and, and you know, they, they, they say that, you know, Brazil's not for beginners, right, is the, the kind of the classic statement. Um, yeah, I mean, labor laws, like, you know, I mean, uh, you know, the, just the whole like tax regime and, you know, a lot of things are improving and like there's been dramatic improvements over the last couple of years. I mean, when I started Fabrice, I couldn't open a bank account. I couldn't create a company. It took us six and a half months for me to legally constitute the company. Uh, so I was I'm living very well. <laughs> I was literally, yeah, it's I'm living illegally in the country for six and a half months. So, I mean, it, it, it's it's gotten easier. It's gotten better. And you know, I think that you know, I don't want to be one of those uh, grandpas that's like I used to walk seven miles in the snow kind of thing, but. <laughs> It feels a little bit like that sometimes. So a few things. So first of all, you, you know, it's interesting that you say, you know, even though you sold your company for whatever seven hundred million dollars, it's not a victory lap. By the way, I feel the exact same way about OLX. You know, OLX to me was the company I was meant to be running the rest of my life. It was going to be a hundred billion dollar company, and legitimately, it is a ten billion dollar company today, and it, and and it actually is impactful in the world. But it's no longer my company, and I didn't want to sell it. I kind of had to sell it because I had a very aggressive publicly traded competitors spending so much money and in 2010 american vcs didn't want to give me a couple hundred million dollars to blow on tv in like pakistan and brazil uh maybe it'd be different today but back then i, I needed to find you know nasper's which bought us and then bought you uh because the the american vcs didn't didn't have that level of like risk taking and ambition especially in emerging markets yeah i mean 2010 in emerging markets you just didn't have any success stories really hardly at all. Right. And so I think that times have changed in this kind of this next decade moving forward. We're off to a good start so far. So I think, uh, you know, it's a timing question also. But we right? talk about how, how hard it is. I mean, you were moving anyway from Colombia to Brazil. You could have moved from Colombia to the U.S. So you would have done a different idea. But like why? Like, were you that wedded to that idea? Why Brazil? I mean, you could have. I mean, if, if, if you're already moving your entire family from Colombia, you could have gone back to the U.S. and San Fran and played the game on very easy mode. No, it would it would have been like the the reality is if you think about the fishing analogy of like the pool, you know the 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 you know the number of fish in the lake, the density of fish, who's fishing, and you know and, and you know like the reality is the market was gig is it's it's a big yeah. market in Brazil, obviously not as big as the U.S. But the people fishing alongside me in the U.S., you know Pete Flint you know, uh, Rich Barton, like these are people that, you know, Rich Barton raised an $80 million, you know, whatever series a round or whatever. And that was in 2005, right. 2006. So like, you know, just the, the, the scale was different. Um, and so I liked being a big fish in a medium sized, uh, pond. 
um, or lake or whatever. And and that was I, I saw that as as an arbitrage. You know, um, I and I think totally you've seen the same thing globally in France when I built my first startup. I was twenty three. It was in ninety eight, and I, I like even though my company was tiny by the standards of anything that I ever built in the U.S. Afterwards, I was like one of the top entrepreneurs in France. So cover of every magazine, you know, like eight o'clock news, no, TV, etc. Big fish, medium pond. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. I mean, that, that made, it made a lot of sense to me from that standpoint. And I just liked that there wasn't that many people fishing in a, in a pretty, you know, nice, nice area. So, uh, you know, ultimately, and also like life's too short, right? Like go learn Portuguese, like go eat amazing food in Brazil. Like why not for, for, for six and a half years. And, you know, I did have a, a, an agreement with my wife that we would spend five years in, in, in Brazil. She wanted to move back to the U S and, you know, we have kids and we wanted to raise them here. So that was a bit of a, uh, you know, a, a, a challenge because I was like, oh, things are going really well. But ultimately, uh, you know, I'm happy with the decision to come back. And now I get to have a foot in Brazil and and I get to, you know, uh, live live up in, in Sonoma County here, which is a beautiful place in part of the world, you know. And, and so you're back in the U.S. with Sonoma County. So what are you up to these days? Like wh what the what's the giving back to the Latin tech ecosystem? It's not it's not just yeah. the book, right? No, no. The book is part of a, a greater initiative. Um, and to put some context to it, like, you know, last year I was waiting for the antitrust to approve the deal, which, you know, is like a, not a fun process because you're, you're the question mark of that. Um, so I decided I needed to distract myself. And so what I did was I actually just communicated externally. If anyone is working on a project to start up in LATAM, let me know. I'll give you free advice. I'll help you. I'll coach you. And I ended up taking 150 phone calls from founders across the region, from Mexico to Argentina. And... I was really impressed by the caliber uh, of the entrepreneur, the quality of the ideas, and in some cases, impressive traction. And I had linked up with um, Gina Gotthilf and Yuri Danilchenko. Gina ran growth at Duolingo, uh, took them from you know a couple million users to 200 million users globally. And, uh, and she's from Brazil. And she, we met at a, a, a fellowship uh, that was around entrepreneurship. And we both identified we wanted to do something. I had been talking to Yuri Danilchenko, who was... Uh, the CTO of a Kazakh-backed company in Sao Paulo. And we had a shared kind of mission of like, how can we elevate the ecosystem? There's so much talent and so much opportunity. And so that's kind of when we informally, organically started Latitude, Latitude without an E, Latitude. And ultimately, we, we talked to all these entrepreneurs and we just decided, let's throw them in a, in a Zoom together. Let's uh, bring in speakers, you know, the people in my network. So you graciously, you know, uh, shared in a session with the teams. Um, and we, we, you know, we have an amazing network. So it's like, why don't we try to, you know, create access um, in three different ways? One, peer learning is an amazing opportunity, right? I mean, talking to, you know, ex, you know, entrepreneur that's, you know, building a $10 billion company, that's great. But like, they don't know, they don't, they're not the reality of your day to day raising a seed round is like so far away from their reality. So finding someone that's just done it or been in that process, there's a lot of peer learning. Second, we have global mentors, people like you, uh, you know, people that, you know, advised me over the years and invested in me, we brought them together, Gina's network brought them together. And now we're helping those founders. And then lastly, we have a team of seven people. And so, and, and what uh, is that sort of so like what, paid for? What, is it free? Do people apply? Anyone can get in? Like just so I understand yeah, exactly. That, I was going to cue you to ask me what the business <laughs> model is, but you already did. So um, listen, Fabrice, uh, right now, uh, the business model is build social capital. Mm -hmm. So it's free. It's equity free. Um, it's I mean, it's like literally the best deal you can ever have. Right. Because we, we do a month long program with like world class advisors and we don't take anything. You know, but do you select and, and the people don't, coming in or can anyone get it? Yes. Yeah. It's a very, very in, intense selection process. We we've interviewed uh, hundreds of the last couple of weeks of founders. So we have a head of admissions. We have uh, you know, and, and a, a team that, you know, a, a, a product engineering team, as well as a, a head of content. And so we're, we're, it's a very like tough process to get so into. So it's a month long free program. Right you do it how many times a year? Uh, we're doing it right now. We, this is our, our, our officially second, even though we had a cohort zero. So it's our third one. It starts next Monday. Uh, we have about 50, 45, 50 founders from all over the region, many second time entrepreneurs, you know, people that were working in big roles in, you know, companies like Amazon and, you know, and New Bank and other companies that 
are now wanting to start their own business. So we will probably hone in on the next batch and focus purely on ideation. Companies okay. that are the ideation and MVP phase um, that typically haven't raised any money yet. And, um, and so we may, we may evolve the model and, you know, we're, so when do you we're, think the next batch is? So I get a sense of frequency. You want to do two a year, five a year, or you don't know yet. Uh, the next batch yeah. will be, will be in April. And, oh, you're doing one a month. You're going to do one in May, one in, uh, or every two Man, months, basically. We're, we're, we're fully, we're fully loaded here. I mean, the wow. amount of entrepreneurs that are coming through our, our platform at this stage. And of course, like I did throw in a couple of checks to some of them. Of I think we've actually looked at a, a handful of deals together, and I think yeah, you guys send are me all the in, a, in a couple. So, so, um, so, so, yeah, that's the idea. We we have some other ideas in terms of what we're going to build, but we're building the community essentially because that's that's kind of what we think sure. is missing. And so, if you actually take capital, advice, and network, and you strip out the capital, you know, I don't think there's a lot of people that are doing advice and network incredibly well. Sure. Um, and so, we're focused on that, and then we'll we'll layer on some capital. I have a rolling fund actually. Uh, I'm going to be hitting you up for a check for that. Um, just so you know, this is live right now. So if you want to commit to putting money live, uh, you can you can go ahead and do that, and I'll accept. Um, but uh, I'd love to I'd love to have you uh, as, a, yeah, as a partner. I, I think it's not a bad idea. I, I'd be happy to invest. It. So, and you invest earlier than we would typically play. So it's a good way to create like lead gen or deal flow ge generation for us. Fabrice, it's R and D for you, man. Like you, <laughs> exactly. you, you, you'll just pick you just pick off all the marketplaces, and then and you can invest in them. Maybe mark my investment up a little bit, but uh, <laughs> exactly. uh, or we co-invest. But uh, no, uh, would love to have you as an LP. Uh, yeah, you know, fun. we've got some amazing LPs. David Vela's just came in this week. We've got you know. How big is that fund? So if you're willing to share. Yeah, yeah, we've we've got a, a handful of really mainly operator and GPs. Like those are the the, the hmm. LPs that we have. So. And uh, you I'll want it to be how big, and you want to write checks of which size to get a sense, or it varies. I'm glad that you confirmed you're going to be an LP and you don't know this information yet. That shows a level of trust that I, I think is, uh, is very appreciated. And that's, 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 that's cool. So listen, uh, what we're doing is, is checks between 50 to 250, okay. um, you know, kind of target equity, you know, five to 10%. And these are very early companies. They're basically, we're betting on amazing founders, right? Second time entrepreneurs. Um, and, and sector wise, it's, you know, marketplace, fintech, um, prop tech, you know, software as a service businesses, you know, basically the main stuff, no biotech stuff, nothing that I don't sure. understand. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the, that's the thesis. I have a feedback, I have an idea or a comment for you in a second, but before I get there, uh, I want to tell the audience, if you have questions, uh, write them in the chat and I'll, I'll ask Ryan, it could be on anything from his background to his ideas, to feedback, whatever, just uh, bring them up and I will ask Ryan in a few minutes. Um, so one idea for you, uh, yes. on, on your fund structure is, so in France, there was um, a fund that's very similar, I think it's called Hook or Hook.vc, and it was basically giving advice and and it's for the found, the companies that are in um, uh, Station F or, which is like this big incubator. And they would get these, these startups in and at the end of their journey, if they are some they like, they would say, now nah, we'd like to invest whatever, 250K for 10%, the prototypical YC type deal. The thing is the very best companies would just not take the deal and they'd already gone on and raised seed, et cetera. And so they were only left in the bad companies. And so they had to change yep. their model to give you some capital, give some capital to every company that came in and have the right to put the rest. And, and that model seemed yep. to work a little bit better because the otherwise they had like adverse selection because the very best companies ended up not taking the deal because it was more dilutive or a lower valuation than they would have that they could frankly garner after they'd gotten the advice than before. Yeah, that's something that we we've, we we actually have that on our radar. We don't want you know we've been actually pretty successful. Like the companies we've wanted to get into, we've been able to invest uh, at lower terms than other investors mainly because we take such small dilution. Yeah. It's it's five percent usually, um, but I like the idea of having a mixed mixed bag of like everyone you know takes takes something, then you you're on the cap table, and then you can have you know pro rata over yeah, time, or you have you the right also... to put in another fifty k or hundred k. Exactly, but, but, but I like the exactly. 5%, by the way, over more because it's so little. People are willing to let you in, especially for returns because the, of the value you provide it. So that, to me, that yeah, kind of I'm also sense. thinking about thinking about taking a page out of your book and. Just writing small checks in all credible deals, right? Like, you know, Kazakh, yeah. Monashis, you know, Valord, you know, LVP in Mexico, Jaguar.
Like we'll, we'll just basically, you know, Mountain Nazca, we'll, we'll tuck alongside yeah. them because founders want us on their, on their cap table. So you've done yeah, that, you'll be you know, invested, to a T. Right? So in putting a small check into all credible deals, you're going to have amazing returns. I mean, the, because the, the category is a really good beta. I mean, it's, you're going to be beta on the category, but the category is amazing returns. So it's exactly the correct strategy. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's one thing. See, these, these are all things in process, but we've proven that we can invest at lower valuations because we've done it a bunch. And I did that as an angel because sure. I, I would just get deal flow and it was just such small dilution that people would be happy with it. One thing also, just as a, an FYF, there's, I know you have a lot of entrepreneurs and investors that watch your stuff. If anyone's curious, they can go to fund.latitude, latitude with the no E at the end, dot com. And that actually take you to the, um, you know, to the, the, the angel list page. So I have a ro it's a rolling fund. Okay. And so the rolling fund works really good with the, uh, the kind of cohorts because every quarter it's a new fund, right? And so you, you basically raise a new fund for every, every cohort and it's all, you know, software stack with, with, with AngelList. So it's, it's pretty awesome way to do it. Uh, I don't know if you're allowed to do general solicitation. So yeah, keep that in mind. I, 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 I am, I am, I am. There's a, uh, there's a jobs act change, uh, under Obama that, uh, it's, it's five, oh, five, oh, six. C reg, I think, or something like that. And uh, you can actually do general solicitation with this type of fund structure, okay, interesting. Uh, which is the reason why, which is the reason why I chose it. And so um, I'm going to say it again now that you mentioned <laughs> that fund.latitude without the e.com. Um, and uh, that was the, I researched the heck out of this process because I, I hate all of the, the management administrative stuff. And so Angelus takes care of that. And then this type of fund structure after consulting with Gunderson and other lawyers, uh, I can I can get on the uh, I can get on TV and talk about it, but better here because I have a targeted audience. Yeah, we 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 do the same thing. I mean, we have a friends and family and entrepreneurs fund. So basically, because we've backed at this point almost 700 startups, it's like 2,000 founders, and all their equity is tied up in one company. They want exposure to what we do, and so we've created an angel structure where they can write like small checks alongside us. I used to do two a year. Um, but it's like a pain in the neck to be raising and sending an email and people, it's a lot of capital calls for people. It's not a capital call, it's just a new fund, but it's the equivalent of a capital call. Now I do one a year. Uh, at the beginning of each yeah. year, I, I go to my founders and, and my family and I'm like, hey, if you want to invest alongside MJ Labs for the coming year, you know, here it is, the uh, the AngelList, and same thing, uh, AngelList does everything, like the KYC, the reporting, the, it's, it's so yeah. much easier, um, but I'm, I'm not sure doing one a quarter is is a great idea at the end of the day because like it feels like you're soliciting your LPs often. Um, and yeah, well, the, the thing is, it's a subscription. So when you actually sign up, you like let's say that you wanted to do you know 250k or 500k or whatever, you would do that over an eight quarter period. Ah, okay. And so so like when you know when David came in, he signed up for 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 the for the next year, right? Okay. And so uh, that that's the way it's set up. So it's okay. No, if, I, if, if, if you do, if, if I give you an amount of money and you divide it by eight and you put one every quarter, that's totally fine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That, that's and and then you can you can also uh, go up or down if you sure. want. Like if you're like, man, I want to double down on this and I want to you know do from twenty five, I want to do fifty a quarter. Then you you just increase the amount and it's you just a, a click of a button. Anything we didn't cover, or news or the, that we should cover, or any any last minute like advice or for founders uh, out there. No, I, I mean, listen, uh, I think that, uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to be on here, Fabrice, because we've known each other for a while now. And, you know, I've been a, 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 a consumer of your content for a while, right? And so uh, I, I, you know, I appreciate kind of your level of transparency. And I think you probably saw the authenticity in my book. Absolutely. Um, of like, you know. Yeah, it is true. My, yeah, and, and, and I think that you, uh, you've demonstrated a, a lot of that candor and authenticity and what the things that you write about. And so, uh, I think that, uh, you know, I, I think that it's great what you're doing and I look forward to doing more stuff with you in terms of other advice to founders. I mean, I guess by the book one and two, I mean, it's all about persistence. It's about focus. We know how hard it is, but you know, there's incredible opportunities and I complained about all the challenges, but we both know how fun this oh, yeah, is, right? Super fun. I can't, I can't do anything else. I can't have a boss. I mean, that's true. There's no, I'm not, I, I describe myself as unemployable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm the same way. I'm the same way. I, I wouldn't do, work well. Do you have well. the book? So th do you want to it on camera? Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I, I don't have the hardcover here, but uh, but I have the, uh, uh, the, this is the, the cover of the book. 
Uh, by the way, it's it's come, it's it's out this week in um, in uh, in Portuguese, and uh, I have an editor in Brazil, and then I just signed a deal last night to uh, produce the audio book in Spanish and the and the print book in Spanish. The audio book will be available next month on Audible as well. I, I read the entire book, um, and so uh, I've been told my voice is not annoying. So I, I think that's a good starting. Point. Cool. Well. Thank you for joining uh, this week, and I'm sure we'll keep working closely together over the coming years. This has been super fun. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. All right. So everyone, thank you for joining this week. Next week, uh, we're going to be covering how to build a SPAC. So I look forward to seeing you next week.